All right, guys, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. If you clicked on this video, you are legitimately interested in playing better golf, not trying to find a Band-Aid uh, for the day. Most of you are really struggling to take your swings to the golf course. This video is basically going to answer some questions as to why your score isn't dropping, guys. I'm going to give you five keys to playing better golf. I think these keys are going to help tremendously. It's going to help you understand what elite golfers do compared with recreational golfers. And I'm absolutely confident that if you grab a notepad and you write down some key things that we're going to discuss today and apply it to your golf game, there's no question. Not only are you going to improve on the golf course, you're going to increase your enjoyment of the game. And that's really what this is all about at the end of the day. If you've not subscribed to my channel, go ahead and press that subscribe button. I'd be very grateful if you did. There's a bell button next door. Click on that. You'll get a notification every time I release a new video. Welcome to my channel. My name is Andrew Emery at Andrew Emery Golf. I wanted to let you guys know I was invited to uh, get on a podcast a little over a week ago called The Par Train, which is run by Matt Cermak and Evan Singer. They help frustrated golfers with their psychology, which is a huge part of what we're going to be discussing today. They have 100,000 followers. They've had a million downloads, and they have all sorts of fantastic guests on their show. I feel extremely honored to have been asked. I think my episode's going to be either next week or the week after. Uh, they've had Sean Foley on there, I think, three times. Parker McLaughlin, he is the short game chef, if you follow him on YouTube. Brett McCabe, a wonderful sports psychologist, uh, has been on, among many others. And they also had the 2024 Sony open champion Grayson Murray on there two weeks ago. If you want to listen to his episode, it's really, really interesting to hear his journey and obviously how well he performed that week as well. So go ahead and check it out, guys. You've got to make sure that you spend as much time focusing on how you're going to play better golf uh, as you do really finding swing tips, which is what most of you are doing on YouTube. I get all sorts of questions on tips on the golf swing, whether it be path or club face or, you know, release and uh, no one's really talking about what they can do to actually improve where it really, really counts. So let's get started, okay? First thing we're going to talk about, my first tip for playing better golf is going to be have to be careful. Number one, be careful. So what do I mean about being careful? Maybe some of you are almost too careful when you play. We're not talking about your golf swing. We're talking about your setup. That's the biggest difference, guys. Perhaps the biggest difference between elite golfers and recreational golfers is that elite golfers are incredibly careful as to how they set up to the golf ball. Their grip, their aim, their alignment, their stance, and the posture, okay? I have an acronym, GASP. In England, we might say GASP, but it's two A's, G-A-A-S-P, grip, aim, alignment, stance, and posture. And most of you aren't paying close attention to enough attention, guys, when it comes to the way you set up to it. You have to understand the way you stand to a golf ball is the cast through which the swing is poured. What do I mean by that? Well, if you stand too far from the golf ball, there's a very, very good chance your swing's going to be too flat. If you stand too close to it, there's a good chance that your swing's going to be too steep. If you've got too much weight on your heels, again, the club may want to gravitate towards your heels. Conversely, too much weight on your toes, the club may want to gravitate to your toes. If you get the ball too far back in your stance, you're most likely going to get ahead of it. You're going to have to hang back. If you play it too far forward, you're going to have to glide too much and you're probably going to slide into the golf ball. I think you catch my drift. What we're doing here, guys, is we're having to compensate if we don't set up to it correctly. And I would say it's the number one thing that I experience working with elite golfers on the PGA Tour and the LPGA Tour. It's the number one thing that I spent working with these great players on their setups, guys. Because once their setups got into a good position, they're so athletic, a lot of this stuff just kind of fell into place. So you have to pay attention and you have to be very, very careful with the details, the small things, okay? Setup is going to be absolutely number one. Number two, you have to do the opposite. And I think this is what makes golf so complex. You have to be somewhat careless as well. But what are you going to be careless about? Well, you have to be careless, guys, 
with regard to the amount of freedom you have when it comes to pulling the trigger, when it comes to swinging the golf club. What you don't want to be doing is swinging tight out there. You don't want to be steering, which is what so many of you are doing. You're concerned with the outcome before you've even taken the club back. Most of you don't realize the amount of bad shots you're hitting out there. Probably 50% of those bad shots you're hitting, you're too concerned with the wind or you're too concerned with the water in front of the green, the smoke and mirrors, of course, that the architect is putting in front of you, okay? You've got to learn to dial it down and swing with a degree of reckless abandon. I like to call it swinging irresponsibly. We need to swing with a degree of freedom, okay, and athleticism, and we need to allow the golf ball to get in the way. And I'm gonna give you a little trick here that I want you to pay attention to. We've got some golf every weekend, guys. This week is the Phoenix Open, okay? And we've also got the Super Bowl on Sunday, okay? Which is gonna be kinda of cool. So we've got a great weekend for sports. And if you look at any quarterback, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and do my British attempt of what a quarterback does, but they get the ball, they get in the pocket, and they are scanning. These quarterbacks are scanning. Where are their eyes, okay? Their eyes are up when they're in the pocket, okay? They are scanning the field, trying to find a receiver, and then they're gonna go ahead and pull the trigger. But what you need to understand, guys, is they're reacting to what they see. They, their eyes are up, and they are spending a ton of time scanning before they react. And if you look at tour players and elite golfers, they do very much the same thing. When a tour player sets up to a golf ball and they get into their routine, from the time they stand behind the golf ball to the time they hit it, they could look at their target as much as 20 times. I'm gonna repeat that, 20 times. What tour players do not do is stare at the golf ball. And there's a huge difference between staring at the target and staring at the ball, which is what recreational golfers do. So a tour player is going to go ahead and glance at the golf ball and stare at the target many, many times. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay, seven. They've already looked at their target probably five, six, seven times before they even set up to the golf ball. It adds up. What amateurs do is they st stare at the golf ball and they'll turn and glance at the target and that's it. So if you're staring down at the ground, guys, you're not going to react to your target dynamically. You're not going to react to your target athletically. You're not going to swing your arms freely through the golf ball towards your intended target. What you're going to do is naturally hit at the golf ball because that's where your mind is focused, okay? If you look at the ground all the time, you are gonna swing your golf club towards the ground. The idea of even swinging to a balanced finish is gonna be very, very difficult because your mind isn't focused on your intention which is to swing through the golf ball. I hope that makes sense. That's what you see with really, really good players. So you have to have your eyes up and you have to swing carelessly in that direction. You need to be reckless. You have to let it go, okay? Don't hang on, let it go. Number three, you have to play within yourself. You see great players playing within themselves all the time. They understand the 80-20 rule. If you can pull the shot off 80% of the time, go ahead and pull the trigger. If it's 70, 60, 50%, do not, okay? Don't take unnecessary risks when you're on the golf course. It only takes one or two really bad holes, what I would describe as blow-up holes, which all of you are having, whether it just be one blow-up hole on the front, maybe it's two blow-up holes on the back. Really put some thought into what happened when you messed up, okay? If you understand the 80-20 rule, much of the time you can hedge and avoid some of these big mistakes, okay? If you change your scorecard, that's terribly helpful. When I was 10 years old, my dad changed the scorecard from a par 72 to a par 108. That's 36 over par. He saw that I was getting frustrated, guys, when I made a seven on the first hole 
because it was a par four. And I'm just a wee kid. I'm 10 years old. And he said, son, you're not a scratch golfer. He went through the whole thing. He explained to me what that meant. Okay. Once he changed the scorecard, my mindset shifted altogether. Okay. I played to my scorecard. What does that mean for you 18 handicappers out there? For example, what you'd want to do is take the two easiest holes on the golf course, make those pars, take the two hardest holes on the golf course, make those double bogeys, and you now have your own personal scorecard. You need to stay in your lane. So when you hit a bad shot on number one, it's not the end of the world. It's not a par four. It may well be a par six. When you have that kind of intent emotionally it takes a lot of pressure off okay what you're going to do is perhaps instead of hitting that three wood out of the rough and turning your five into an eight maybe you're going to grab a seven iron and you're going to hit it down the fairway on the left side and go ahead and make a five instead so those are incredibly important guys so learn to play within yourself number four I talked about this a lot on the Par Train podcast, okay? Detachment, emotional detachment. You're the only one that cares that you're not playing well, okay? You think other people in the group really care? They're more focused on their own game, guys, okay? You've got to learn to press the delete button anytime you start hitting bad shots or you get yourself upset out there. You can feel the frustration. We've all been there. But we have a supercomputer, guys, between our ears that has a circuit board. And we've got to learn to interrupt that circuit board. And that's the one thing I noticed I traveled to three continents. You know, I've been to uh, the Masters. I've been to the Players' Championship. I went to the Solheim Cup with the players I was coaching. And you just observe these guys. You know, they're under, playing under a tremendous amount of pressure. And what I noticed was their ability to press the delete button was extraordinary. They never really got terribly upset. So you own the keyboard, guys. It's right in front of you, okay? Learn to press that delete button interrupt your own circuit board and write a better program when you start to get upset. It's not as hard as you might think, believe it or not. You just have to have more self-awareness. If you're going to have any kind of attachment, it should be to those things that are positive, okay? Enjoying yourself out there is a really big thing, okay? Being aware of your environment, showing some gratitude, okay, in your own way, just the fact that you're out there playing with your buddies and having a good time. These are the things you want to be emotionally attached to, not terrible goal shots. Let those things go, okay? They're wasted energy. And that brings us to number five, guys. Absolutely great segue here into having fun, because in my opinion, fun is a choice. No matter how bad you play, remember, good company, lots of things that we could be doing that would be nowhere near as much fun as playing golf, even if you are struggling out there. So just make sure you get your mindset in the right place. You can have a good time out there no matter how you're playing. I know we want to play well, but if you go through these keys one by one, I'm absolutely confident that not only are you going to play better golf, you're going to have more fun out on the golf course. So I hope this helps today. Definitely wanted to talk about a little bit of golf psychology and some things we can do that'll take that swing from the driving range to the golf course. Don't get too caught up in multiple swing thoughts. There's nothing worse than paralysis by analysis. One swing feel is probably all I would take to the golf course, but I'm doing it, guys, with my eyes up. I'm doing it with intention to hit my target, and that's what I want you to understand. Have fun out there, guys. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Enjoy the golf. Phoenix Open. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll talk to you next time.